Hi everybody and welcome to basically we are in week two now. Congratulations for basically making it through week one. We are still in the uh, COVID-19 basically era where everything is, uh, is online. So I'm hoping that's uh, going well for you guys. Uh, we have assignments that are due today, actually one assignment that is due tonight. I think there is more than one. Let me double check to make sure. I, I hope that you guys are on top of this assignments that you guys have, which is the flat earth assignment, which is due today. There was also something else. Let me check on the, all the assignments in here. Let me go back home in here. So uh, the flat earth is due today. Chapter two discussion is due this Saturday. That's when you're going to receive the grade for that. And uh, there is a quiz that is due on the third. So there is only one thing due today. And that is your uh, basically intro of yourself. It is very critical that you guys remember to include a picture of yourself. You don't want to lose unnecessarily points for that, okay? And uh, Jeffrey, I sent a reply to you. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it or not, but I think uh, you might have been looking at something else because from my end, everything looks fine, okay? Uh, like I said, I graded only one assignment and that assignment is actually the one that was already due. I mean, past due now. And uh, the others are still either in progress, one of them to do due tonight and a few others are due this week. So I hope you guys are on top of these things and, you're, uh, uh, and you have them mastered. There is a critical assignment that is coming on the third. Do not forget that. That's, uh, that's very important. Uh, today is the first. So in Thursday, which where we are going to meet again, by then I hope that everybody would have done the quiz and have received a grade on that quiz. That is crucial, okay? So I hope that you guys will uh, complete that, the ones who did not. And I know about half the class did not do it. So I hope that the other half who did not do it, are on, I mean, they come by Thursday, they would have uh, finished that. That's automatically graded. So there's nothing I can do about that. So hopefully you guys are on top of it and do that too. So that's in terms of assignments, in terms of uh, what else? Uh, that's, that's it. This chapter is, like I said, is, uh, is light. You will have also an assignment today in this chapter. So, and that assignment is the discussion that is going to ensue. It's going to follow this, uh, this uh, chapter. So hopefully you guys will uh, watch this, uh, um, like you guys are here live, that's fine. But I'm addressing the people who are not live, the ones who cannot make it, that they will watch the whole video so that to complete their assignments correctly. Yes? Very good, at least one person responding to, okay. Okay, I'm glad Jeffrey now is happy too. Okay, okay, everybody's good. So let's get going now. Okay, so where is my PowerPoint in here, if I can find it? There it is. So today's topic is about motion. Again, we're still within the first, basically, uh, uh, the starting point, if you wish, of this class. We discussed the first law of Newton, which basically says if you, if you don't mess around with something and leave it by itself and there are no net forces, it's going to stay where it is. So it's going to be in its place, okay? Now things, of course, they, they tend to move. Of course, the first law also stated that if an object was moving at uh, initially and it's under no net forces, that object will continue moving with the same speed in the same direction forever and ever. So now we need to understand this motion. We need to quantify it. And the person who did an extensive work basically on this concept is Galileo himself. And he gave us uh, uh, the concept of acceleration, which turned out to be crucial to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to motion. Let's try to understand, let's try to understand basically uh, the question itself, how it's asked, okay? I want to know where the object is, that's it. That's all I want to know, so that's the question. If I know where the object is, 
any time that you ask me what the object is, I have a full description of its state of motion. That's it. I know what the object is. However, the object may be changing its position over time. So that's the problem. So I need to keep track of that. I need to keep track of where the object not only is right now, but where it's going to be in the future. Second from now, two seconds from now, an hour from now, and so on and so forth. Now, if you give me the rate at which its position is changing with time, I should apply that rate to compute where it's going to be in the future times. So if you tell me the object right now, for example, is in Riverside, and it's moving with 50 miles per hour eastward, so I can tell you in one hour where the object is going to be. Let's say, for example, it's taking Highway 60 and then merging to 10 and going east. So 50 miles from Riverside in one hour where the object is going to be eastward. So that's basically one way of doing it. You ask, okay, in two hours, where the object is going to be? Well, in two hours, it's going to be, have covered at least 150 miles in the first hour and another 50 miles in the second hour for a total of 100 miles. So I can do this logic for whatever time you ask me. You tell me, okay, how about three hours? Okay, well, the first hour it would have covered 50 miles. The second hour it would have covered another 50 miles. And the third hour it would have covered the third 50 miles for a total of 150 miles in these three hours. So I'm going to follow the line on Interstate 60, see where it merges with the 10, and find that distance of 150 miles from that starting point. That is where the object is. So if you want to go and find it, that's where the object is exactly at. That would have been great if the velocity does not change itself, if the speed is the same both in its direction and its magnitude. What if that person decides to make a U-turn at 50 miles per hour and come back? Well, my calculation is wrong in this point because I said it's going to be in this point, whereas it has moved to a different location or turned to a different location. The fact that the velocity can change, let's say, for example, he did not maintain that 60, 50 miles per hour. At some point, slow down because of traffic, for example, it's going 10 miles per hour. So in this problem, my calculation is flawed. In three hours, I would have computed that it's at uh, 150 miles from my uh, starting point, but it is not. It's less, actually, because it traveled less and less speed. Or let's say, for example, the person decided to hit the accelerator and go 60 miles per hour. Then again, my calculation is short because of the fact that the person has gained velocity in the process. So gaining or losing speed is one way for me, for, for the system to defeat my, 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 my predictions or changing the direction. Let's say, for example, it's going on the, uh, and then hit the Highway 79, went south on Highway 79. At that point, I'm following the line, thinking that the person just stayed on the freeway, but it did not, it changed direction. And maintain that speed, if you wish, keep him at 50 miles per hour. So at that point, I still, my calculation is not accurate. So for me to be able to really predict where the person is, where the, 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 the object is going to be at any time in the future, not only I need the velocity, but I need how the velocity is changing with time also, both in magnitude and direction too. So I need those quantities, namely, and that is what the acceleration is. The acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing with time. That is all this chapter is about. That is basically in a nutshell what this chapter is about. It talks about this, how these things are related to one another. And one of them is the rate of changing a position with time. And the second is the rate of the rate of changing the position with time, namely it's the rate of the velocity. So this is where the thing is. This is what we need. Some of you probably heard of a third thing when that is the rate at which the acceleration is changing with time, but we really don't care for that because at this point, all I am interested in is the position. For as far as the position, all I need is just these two rates. The rate of the position, how it changes with time, and the rate at which the rate of this position is changing with time, that's enough. If you're curious about how the acceleration is changing, but that's just giving you the acceleration, that's all, okay? So the first thing that we will need to know is uh, uh, motion is relative. Motion is not, there is no such a thing as an absolute motion, okay? 
and then we will try we'll understand the concept of speed and contrast that with the concept of velocity in a nutshell the speed is the magnitude of the velocity the velocity is a higher uh, concept than the speed speed is a uh, one component of what the velocity is velocity is both speed and direction of speed so that's basically a vector and the other one is scalar and then we'll discuss the concept of acceleration it turns out also the acceleration has direction so there is a value for it how much we're changing and also the direction with which is changing so that also matters and then we will uh, explore the concept of free fall that's what mr galileo did for us basically calculated the value of the uh, free fall acceleration and then we'll discuss the concept of vector again trying to understand how we add up direction velocities you have one object for example is drifting in space this way but it's being pulled on the other side so it's going to drift in between it's going to go what is known as a resultant so the resultant is the sum of the two vectors for those of you who are sitting in physics 11 there is a lab that is do this uh, that is starting this Thursday which is all about resultants it's all about basically vectors add additions and things like that so that's basically something that connect between the physics 10 and physics 11 for those who are not sitting in physics 11 you're just going to get it in here and you're done with it let me ask you guys a question okay let me pick an object in here let me see if this is high enough object so you guys can see yeah i think you can see it i have an object in my hand in here i hope you guys can see it it's supposed to be a it's in my hand in here do you guys see it or not okay everybody sees it so if a couple of you see it that's good now i'm going to ask you is this object stationary or moving okay jacqueline thinks it's stationary samantha also can anybody question these people and think that maybe there is something flawed in my question can anybody think that maybe there is something wrong in here now when i move with my hand it's true it's it's moving because my hand is moving but if i keep my hand standing still okay okay kyle thinks it's more position is in space moving why can you give me a hint on to why is that <laughs> no not that okay <laughs> not that okay let me give you the answer to this okay we are not sitting i know some of you probably it's on your hand some of you might think yes that's very good ways that's uh, that's the point actually i was trying to get into because the earth that we're sitting on is spinning so fast around this axis look the earth diameter itself um, the earth radius is 6400 kilometers 6400 kilometers times 2 pi times 6 basically 6000 times 6 is about 36000 kilometers that's basically the 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 circumference of the earth that circumference is traveling in 24 hours once around its axis yesterday around this time we were here the earth just spun this whole thing in 24 hours so we traveled 36000 in just 24 hours now you divide, you divide the, you do the math. So that's going to be over a thousand kilometers per, per hour. That's basically how much we're, fa we're moving. Now it's been like 15, 15 minutes since we started. That's a quarter hour. We have traveled from where we were 15 minutes ago, almost 200 kilometers, about 150 miles or so. So we're not uh, setting it. I mean, if you hold this one and not drink any coffee, stick to whatever thing is, or put it on a table desk if you like on the computer and wait for it 15 minutes it would have traveled by itself 150 kilometers or 150 miles that's a long distance in addition to how fast the earth is spinning around the uh, the sun and that is 30 kilometers for every second so imagine in 15 minutes how long that is so it tra traveled so far from one edge to the other so motion itself the fact that this is stationary is with respect to my reference frame with respect to me 
what I'm sitting in here or respect to your monitor or your screen. That is stationary. But within another frame of reference, it's moving. Like, for example, with, the, uh, with, the, with respect to the sun, it's moving because the entire earth is spinning. Okay? This, with respect to the earth, is stationary. But with respect to another th object, other than with respect to the moon, for example, this is moving. So that's the idea behind it, that motion is relative. What seems to be stationary may be moving in another reference, in another, uh, basically, uh, point of view, if you like. What seems to be stationary, for example, you're driving your car, you have the cruise control on, and you have your cup of coffee next to you, okay? This is the second time we're mentioning coffee, okay, Kyle? So we have a cup of coffee next to us, and we're driving. You look at the cup of coffee, and it looks stationary, almost, basically, just because of the bumps of the road, a little bit there is a, that uh, motion. But you can take the coffee, and you can sip it, and you can put it back, as if... The whole thing, as far as you're concerned, the entire inside of the car is stationary. You could be basically reading a book if somebody else is driving. And nothing seems to be out of the ordinary. For somebody watching you zooming by at 50 miles per hour, way, if you're, you're moving. So again, the concept of motion is relative in this case. As far as you're concerned, you're stationary. As a matter of, you're concerned, as a matter of fact, you see that guy going in the opposite direction. The entire road and the, all of the cars and everybody else on the road is being basically dragged as far as you're concerned, including the, the, the signs next to you on the freeway and the cow on the other side, whatever you're looking at, as far as you're concerned, it's moving in the opposite direction. Because you're sitting still and sipping your coffee, you're not moving at all, and everything else is moving in the opposite direction. So that is what I meant by it to, to be uh, uh, relative. If it were not for those bumps and those accelerations, you would not really tell which one is moving and which one is stationary, okay? The acceleration is the one actually that makes the difference. Otherwise, otherwise, as far as the constant motion, both of them are equivalent. Did I try to make my point? Is it a little bit clear? Oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> if you decelerate, watch where the coffee will go. It's going to be a mess in the car, okay? So that's most of the messes on my car They're coming from the coffee. That's a good point, Kyle. Okay, decelerate or even accelerate. If you accelerate and you have your coffee and you're trying to drink it or water or something, the whole thing comes to your face, okay? So one of the two will, uh, will cause that mess. Otherwise, you could do, you could drink fine. You have no problem whatsoever. You can have your coffee or water whatsoever. Okay, so let's continue this idea. So this is basically an overview and the point that motion is relative, okay? Brings us to the next slide that we, our day-to-day -day experience, and this was actually one of the problems that people faced in the end. And I think we talked about that, that the earth is actually stationary because we were accustomed to it. We were living on it. We do everything on it. We move on it. We stop on it. We think that the earth is stationary, but it's not. So we're living on a reference frame, actually. Our reference frame is the earth. And everything is described how it moved with respect to earth, okay? Something is sitting still, we say it's stationary. Something is moving on it or with respect to it, then we say it's moving. And that's fine because, again, we have the choice where to put our reference frame. We can put it wherever we want to, okay? We usually try to make it easy for ourselves and make it something intuitive. I mean, for myself in this room, I probably would put one of the walls as, as a reference frame and how far, far I moved in or out of with respect to that wall. But uh, in the lab, we have a reference point in there where we're doing things on the, on the screen. We have a reference frame, for example, the starting point in the lower bottom. As a matter of fact, if you do a little bit of programming on the screens, monitors, the starting point is always to the top and uh, left so that any point on space then has coordinates with respect to that point, okay? So this is just to give you an idea that this concept is, is this clear? Yes? Good? Okay, very good. So, again, the concept of a speed is a rate at which distance is covered, okay? Distance is traveled. So if you have a, a 10 meter distance or 30 feet distance, how long does it take you to walk it? That is your speed. That's how much you're covering uh, 
space with respect to time, okay? So a girl ran four meters in two seconds, her speed is then four divided by two. So it's just a ratio. But do not forget the units, it's critical because we do physics and in physics it has to be a measurable quantity. So for those, I mean, even the questions on quizzes and things that are open uh, under statements, do not forget the units, because if you forget the units, basically as if you're giving me nothing. So if you, somebody says your girl is running four meters in two seconds, and you say that her speed is two, to what? You have to give it in uh, units, two miles per hour, two meters per hour, two whatever. So it has to be in this case, two meters per second, which is if I want to convert it, I have to multiply it by a thousand and uh, multiply it by 3,600 divided by a thousand. So it's gonna be about what, two times 3.6 is gonna be about seven kilometers per hour or something like that, which is about five miles per hour. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, five miles per hour. Can I believe that? That's actually uh, going too fast, okay? But you have to maintain that speed, of course. If, I, if you go for a mile, if I, for a mile, that's, Five miles, that's too much, okay? I walked from uh, uh, Redlands to Riverside once, which was 11 miles, and it took me about four hours, okay? So, okay. The total distance covered divided by uh, the, so that's the average speed. The average speed is the total distance, okay? So you go from starting point to an ending point, and that is your average speed. For those, again, who are, who are taking physics 11, they have actually an experiment on it where they have an object traveling between two ends, photogates, and the two photogates, that distance is the distance traveled divided by the time. But in that specific problem, actually, the, the object is gaining speed. So the speed on the bottom is actually higher than the speed on the top, but on average, it's that speed. I mean, for those who are not taking that class, it's not very hard to understand because all you have is, I'm taking this phone in here, which is, if, if, if I incline this surface and drop the object, it's going to gain speed. Obviously, the speed is less on the top than in the bottom. So if I drop it in here, it's going to gain speed. But if I'm interested only in average speed, then all I care about is how long does it take for it to cover the entire incline? If I can measure the incline, how big it is, and the time it took to do it, that is my average speed. So drive a, a distance of 200 kilometers in two hours, that means 200 divided by two in this case is going to be 100 kilometers per, per hour. So this is, this is, I mean, that experiment, the one that I talked about in the case of the incline illustrates the point. The speed is changing. If I drop it in here and I let go of it, it's not gonna stay in there, it's going to start moving. So the object is actually gaining more and more speed. So the fact that it has a speed on the top, which is less than the speed on the bottom, I want to find just the average value. Okay, how long does it take to do it? So for example, you leave uh, 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 Riverside, you start driving 50 miles per hour, then you slow down, uh, go for example, 40 miles per hour, then you speed up to 60 miles per hour, then you slow down for another 30 miles per hour, then you speed, uh, speed up to 65 miles per hour. And on average, the whole distance may have taken you probably half an hour, okay? And the distance is, let's say, for example, 40, uh, 40 miles. It took you half an hour. So on average, in this case, you did 40 divided by half an hour, which gives you, oh man, this is 80 miles per hour. So my calculations are wrong. <laughs> let's take the speed to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be less than that. Let's take the distance to be less than that or the time to be more than that. Let's say it took you, for example, for the 40 miles, it took you 40 minutes, for example. So in this case, you do the ratio and you will find an average speed between what the numbers I throw in the beginning, okay? So the average has to be somewhere between the highest value and the lowest value. So if you slow down to 30 miles per hour, the lowest speed and the highest speed was 65 mi miles per hour, your average speed is just somewhere in between, okay? Depending on how long did it take you to go with the faster speeds and the slower speeds. So it's a kind of weighted average, but it's an average nonetheless. So if you did, let's say for example, 50 miles, and it took you about an hour to do it, your average speed is 50 miles per hour. Granted, at some point, you may be going 70 miles per hour, and some other times you may be going only 30 miles per hour. But on average, it's that the whole distance. So that's why that's the, 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 this concept is just giving me an average. You may have gone to Riverside and came back from Riverside, so the total distance in this case covered is zero uh, distance. 
you left home, you went to work, you came back from work at the end after eight hours. So the average speed is actually zero in this case because the total distance traveled in this case is, or the total displacement, the displacement in this case is zero, okay? So the average speed of driving 30 kilometers in one hour is the same as the average speed of, is it 30 kilometers in half an hour? That's not correct because 30 divided by one is not 30 divided by two, by one half. And uh, we have uh, 30 kilometers in two hours. That's not correct because 30 divided by one is not uh, like 30 divided by two. 60 divided by one half, that is actually 120. If you do 60 kilometers in half an hour, that means in one hour you're bound to do 120 kilometers per hour. But 60 divided by two is the same as 30 divided by, and, uh, by one. So if you do 30 kilometers in one hour, that means in two, hour, in two hours, you're gonna cover twice as much distance, which end up to being 60 kilometers, okay? So this is, this is basically the ratios, that's all. For some reason, I can't see the, uh, the chat while I'm in, uh, in share, sharing mode because that goes blank. And I know a lot of you like to send things on the chat session. So the instantaneous speed is what you look at when you look at the odometer. I know I'm giving a lot of examples with a car, but that's not the only necessarily motion that we can think of. But the odometer of the car is a good way of checking your speed. For example, you notice that the second your car is doing 41 miles per hour, the next second is 45 miles per hour, then it drops probably 43 miles per hour, even with the cruise control on. Sometimes it fluctuates, goes up and down, and those fluctuations are actually the instantaneous value is that moment how much speed it is. For me to measure the speed, I have to do two measurements actually. I have to know the position of the car now, and I have to know the position of the car later. The position of the object at this instant and the object, position of the object later instant. So take the difference between the positions, namely how much did we travel in that difference of time. In that span of time, which is the difference between the two measurements of time, and the distance traveled between those two positions, that ratio, distance over time, the difference in time is actually what the speed is. So we really have to do two measurements to find the speed. First measurement is to find the position of the object at an initial time. The second measurement has to be finding the position of the same object at a later time. So we need a ruler to measure those positions and we need a clock, we need a watch to measure those times. That's all we need to find the speed. Find the ratio of the two and we're in business, okay? Now, if we make these two measurements very close from one another, right one after the other, take reading now and take reading immediately after. That is what we mean by instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed. And like the first one, which takes a whole span of time, which could be seconds or minutes or hours or days or years as far as, for example, uh, inter, uh, stellar objects, for example, we take measurements after many years and find their speed over a long period of time because they are very far away. The ratio can still be a small number or a high number depending on uh, the, uh, the distance traveled. So the fact that we take that on a very long span of time doesn't mean that the number of the ratio is going to be uh, smaller or any bigger because if we take it very long and the distance traveled is very long, the ratio could end up being even bigger or smaller. Whatever the ratio end up to be is the ratio end up to be, okay? So this is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, concept of instantaneous speed is the measurements are taken one after the other, okay? So that's what the, uh, the concept is. As a matter of fact, this is a, bond, a borderline between physics and math. Math takes instantaneous value by doing something called the limit. And the limit when the change in time is zero. Of course, we can't do that physically. This is impossible to do. Even your odometer has to take a finite amount of time between one measurement and the next measurement. So this is where the limits of what we do in physics basically break and where the math actually takes over. And the branch of mathematics that does that is called the calculus actually. Okay, I know a lot of you probably are not uh, taking that, but that's fine. I'm just giving you for your information, okay? Anyway, the concept of velocity 
as I said, to begin with is uh, uh, the uh, both the the speed description of the speed and the direction. If somebody says you, I am driving and I'm looking at my odometer, it's 50 miles per hour. Uh, when do you think I will uh, reach you? Or which way, where, where do you think I will be an hour from now? You cannot tell unless you tell me the direction in which the person is traveling. Okay, so you need the direction also, okay? So the velocity is actually a vector quantity, not a scalar one. And the vector has two things in order to, to quantify it. It has both a m magnitude and direction. That's what vectors are. Velocity is an example of the vector. Force also is an example of vector. So constant speed is basically a steady motion. A constant velocity is both direction and motion. They are, they are actually, uh, they, are, they are constant. So in order to talk about the speed, uh, velocity is constant, you have to maintain both the speed and the direction. So in all of this example, what we're doing in the lab, we do them with respect to the earth. So we're taking the earth as our reference frame, okay? So the experiments for those of who are doing, again, physics 11, or the observation we do and mention in this class, they are all related, taken as if from the standpoint of the earth, basically, as being stationary. Of course, you know, and I know the earth is not stationary. So if you're interested in trying to find things with respect to Mars, go ahead. Take your Mars as your uh, starting point and start adding all kinds of vectors left and right, and you're going to make your life very, very hard, very quickly, okay? Leave that to uh, what is in uh, Elon Musk or whatever his name is, the one that uh, basically interested in going into Mars. Let him do that. For us, we're going to deal with Earth, okay? So uh, the acceleration is another concept, and I already explained to where that is needed because the fact that the person can change the velocity. So if the velocity is changing with time, I need to know how the velocity is changing with time in order for me to, to, to better basically predict the position of the object later on in time, okay? Or actually do a, a history, historical uh, analysis of the position of the object, basically based where it was before in the past, because time can be in the present or, I mean, can be in the future or in the past. So I can just reverse the clock and tell you where the object was in the past if I know how it was also in terms of its acceleration and velocity. So I can tell you where the object uh, came from, okay? So there is some forensic, if you wish, science in here involved. I can do stuff in the past too, not necessarily in the future. Okay, there are some concepts that you have to understand in here. The object is accelerating if it gains velocity, if it gains speed, I should say. You were doing 50 miles per hour, now you're doing 51 miles per hour, so you actually are accelerating and gaining speed. Or the object could be decelerating in a sense you were doing 50 miles per hour, now you're doing 45 miles per hour, so you're losing speed. You did not change direction. The, the acceleration is opposite to the motion. So you're still moving this way, but the, the acceleration can be in the opposite direction, meaning over time you're going to come to a stop probably. So that's a deceleration. A steady motion, no, no, uh, no change in speed, that is basically when the acceleration is exactly zero. Now that is the value of the, acceler the velocity changing with respect to the acceleration. The acceleration can also change the orientation of the object. The object can be going on a curve left or right. And you can feel that. To go back to our example of the coffee initially sitting next to you and you're sipping it. And when uh, Kyle mentioned the fact that if you stop, then the coffee will spill all over the place. And I mentioned again that if you accelerate, the coffee also still will sp spill all over the place. You don't need to accelerate or decelerate and you will have the same effect. All you have to do, go on a curve, okay? And the coffee still will uh, spill over and fall. So if you're putting your cup next to you and you go on one side or the other, even with the cruise control on, you're still going to spill coffee that way. So not necessarily gaining speed or losing speed can, make the, can uh, uh, get to the acceleration. All you need is just changing direction, that's all, of the motion. And keep the, 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 the value of the speed the same. Keep your cruise control on if you like. But if you go on a curve, especially if it's a sharp curve, you will feel it more so than the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, wide curve. And that is because the 
This type of acceleration that deals with the curve depends on two things, actually. It depends on the velocity itself and depends on the curvature of the turn. So if you're going at a sharp radius, I mean sharp turn, that means the radius is very small. The curvature is very small. If you go on a wide turn, that means the radius is very big and actually the curvature is uh, very small in this case because the radius is very big. So you take a big curve to turn, okay? So that's basically what this concept of curvature is, which is the radius basically from the center of rotation. Obviously right now, you think that the floor of your room where you're sitting is actually flat. You know, and I know it's not. There is a big curve, which is the earth. Earth, that, 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 that is the curvature of the earth, but we cannot notice it because it's so big that we think that we're driving on a flat uh, surface, but it is not. We're going actually on a curved step. So there is an acceleration that we deal with on a regular basis, and that is the same type, the one that you deal with when you go on a curve one way or the other, and that is this big curve of the earth, but the horizon is so far away that we can't really feel it, basically, because as I mentioned before, the radius of the earth is 6,400 kilometers, and we are only about a meter to two meters, basically, in uh, our sizes. The tallest one of us is probably a little over two meters. So for us, 6,400 kilometers is infinity. There is no, you cannot see the, uh, you cannot feel that effect. Okay. So this is what I meant earlier by going on a curve and having the same observation as Kyle duly noted. And everybody else also after that, that the coffee actually will spill in this case, even though you maintain your speed, okay? So acceleration changes in speed, either you gain speed or you lose speed, or change in direction, or both. You could still be going on a curve and basically decelerating or accelerating. So you could do both, and then it's gonna be a mess, okay? Definitely have to go to the car wash and have them vacuum the inside and clean the inside, okay? <laughs> Okay, so again, the acceleration now is the change in velocity over the span of time where this thing happened. So its units are not meter per second because those units are for the velocity, but that per second too. So it's meter per second for every second. Or in the case of the car, they tell you this car, for example, uh, uh, goes from zero, zero to 60 in five seconds. So it goes 60 miles per hour for every five seconds, 60 divided by five is what? What is it? 60 divided by five? 10 divided by five, 12 point something meter per, no, it's not 12, is it 15? Okay, I, my, I can't do mental math now. 12, yes. So it's 12 miles per hour Per second, you see the 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 uh, the idea in here. So we have this question: the automobile is accelerating when it is slowing down to a stop. That is accelerating. It's a negative acceleration. Rounding a curve at steady speed. That is an acceleration because we're changing direction, or both of the above. Of course, it's both of the above. Okay. So the correct answer is both of the above. Acceleration and velocity are actually the same. That is not correct. They are not the same. That's why we need one and the other. We, if they are the same, then we will just need one of them. Rates, but for different quantities, absolutely correct. One of them is the rate at which distance is covered with time, and the other one is the rate at which the velocity is changed with time. So they are different quantities. So the correct answer should be B. Okay. Galileo was able to measure the, uh, the, the, uh, the acceleration and he did not have a watch at that time. Do you think, do you know what he used to find this acceleration? Did I say that last time? What kind of watch did you use? No, not the watch. Yes, the yeah, the pulse basically. Yes, that's the watch he used. Okay, and he found the value for the acceleration which we use today. So his measurements were very, very accurate, 9.8 and 
meter for every second per second, basically. That's the value that you use. There's different inclines, of course. The, the idea with the incline is if the angle of the inclination is small, the object will accelerate, but slowly. So it gives you time, actually, even with a lousy uh, watch to, uh, to find the time it took for it to, to gain that velocity. Okay? Obviously, there will be a problem with the friction at that point, but then the friction will be less, actually, with less velocity. So again, you could do this experiment at home and check for yourself that the value with which objects accelerate is 9.8 meter per second for every second, if they are on a free fall. Of course, if they are on an incline, it's less. And it depends on that angle of inclination, actually, okay? It depends on that value. It's going to be sine theta, the sine of that angle times 9.8. Yes, absolutely, okay? So that's a question from Jeffrey. Yeah, the, the, the value of G is being 9.8 meter per second per second or nine meter per second squared. Uh, I mean, we, we say 9.8 meter per second squared, the acceleration, but that's really uh, uh, the correct way of actually saying it is nine meter per second. That's the velocity we're gaining for every second, but it's the same thing. It's mathematically the same expression, okay? So again, here is the, what we received from there, falling under the influence of gravity. That's what the free fall is. So an object is under free fall. Even the air resistance should not be accounted for. So an object under free fall, a free falling object on earth accelerate to, we use 10 meter per second per second, but you could, that's an approximation of the correct value, which is 9.8 meter per second per second or 9.8 meter per second squared, okay? Again, here are some of the laws that govern the free fall. Uh, basically, uh, if the object has a 10 meter per second, this is the acceleration, and it was dropped from rest. So it did not have any initial velocity to begin with. So it's going to gain 10 meter per second after one second, and it's going to gain another 10 meter per second after the second second, so for a total of 20 meter per second. And it's going to gain another 10 meter per second for the third second, to be at 30 meter per second. So that's basically in a free fall. The position though, so basically in here, at a particular instant, a free falling object has a speed of 30 meter per second. So you measure the speed of that object and you found it's going 30 meter per second. One second later, so it should gain another 10 meter per second. Is its speed stays the same? No, because it's accelerated in a free fall, okay? Is it going to be 35 meter per second? No, it's going to be more than 35 meter per second because it's going to gain 10 meter per second. So it has to be more than 35 meter. How, how much more? We know it's going to be 40 meter per second, okay? That is if we take the value of 10 meter per second per second or the 9.8, if it's actually, somebody is actually being a little bit more accurate, it would say actually it's not gonna be exactly 40 meter per second, but it's either going to be 39.8 meter per second, and that's fine. That's why the correct answer in here is C. The distance though follows this law. The distance traveled is one half times the acceleration, which we're gonna approximate to 10 meter per second squared times the time squared. Look at the units in here, how they match perfectly. The time squared in here is a second squared and the acceleration has in this denominator second squared. The second squared of the numerator and the second squared of the acceleration cancel. And the distance will be as it should be in meters. So you can always do something called dimensional analysis to check your answer. The distance traveled better be meters, not in any other units. So. After one second, if the object, how much distance will travel? One second, I will have one half times 10, that's five, times one squared. And one squared is one times 10, that's 10 divided by two, that's five. Five meters after one second. After two seconds, two seconds squared, that's four seconds squared. Times 10 meter over second squared, that's gonna be 10 times four, that's 40. Divided by two, that's gonna be 20 meters because the second squared cancel. And for three seconds, it's gonna be three times three, that's nine. Second squared times 10, 
that's 90, cancel the units of the second square, that's 90 meters, divided by two, that's 45 meters. So we can find what the position of the object all the times using that expression. And in Howard, for 40 seconds, you can apply four times four, that's 16, times 10, that's 160, divided by two, that should be 80, the correct answer in here. We're almost done with this chapter, okay? Here is with the fact that the velocity is actually a vector and it adds up like vectors. So in here, in here, there's a lot of words in here. You have to pay attention to this verbiage in here. Sometimes it's confusing. The 60 kilometer crosswind blows the 80 kilometer per hour airplane off its course at 100 kilometers per hour. So the wind that blows at 60 miles per hour, I mean 60 kilometers per hour, the plane is going 80 miles per hour in here. So instead of going up north, it's going to drift toward the east. And this is the speed with which it's going to move. So it's actually going faster, but in the wrong direction. So it's going to end up somewhere else, okay? Faster, because the wind is some, to some extent is helping it. Now I said, if the crosswind were 80 kilometers per hour, so now if the wind is actually 80 kilometers per hour, this speed with which it's going to drift is actually going to be higher because now there is more speed. But at what direction? Now, this is going to be a right angle triangle in this case, but both sides would be equal. This is 80 and the other one 80. So not only it's a right angle triangle, but also it's an uh, isol, uh, I, 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 an isocell. I'm sorry, the, I saw, I just lost the word in English, an isocell, okay? Two sides, the same side, okay, sorry, okay. And it's a right angle triangle. So in this case, it's going to be 45 degrees because this angle and the other angle add up to 90 degrees and this one also is a 90 degree angle. So the correct answer should be 45 degrees. Simple case to find this direction is to divide the ratio of these two. This is would be 80 as from this diagram. And this is also 80. The arc tangent of uh, 80 over 80 should be one. Thank you very much, okay? Isosceles, yeah, and nisocelle in French, okay? And probably not too far from the Spanish also word, okay? Thank you for helping me on this thing in here. Sometimes I lose words. Okay, so hopefully you guys understand the, uh, the, the physics of it. Forget about the words and what they mean and put math and things like that, as long as you understand. It's going 80 kilometers per hour. The wind is blowing 80 kilometers per hour. The two sides are the same. These two angles must be the same and they add up to 90 degrees because they have to add up with this one for a right angle triangle to complement 280 degrees. So this is 45, the other one must be 45. So it's going to go at 45 angle distance. It's going to go basically not north, not south, uh, not east, but it's going to be northeast, okay? And the last question is, you run at four, four meter per second in a vertical direction with the rain blowing at four meter per second relative to you, the raindrops are forming an angle again at 45 degrees because of the same reason. Because these two things are in the same thing. Otherwise, you use really trig, complicated algebra for trig, okay? You have to use the sine, the cosine, the tangent, and all of the things. And I know this class probably is not required for it to have trig. But uh, if you basically uh, try to understand it, that's really where the reason where these angles are coming from. If the two sides are the same, that's how it should work, okay? Any questions for this lecture? Okay, let me tell you. We will have a question, and the question is related to the last topic, basically, and the answer is 45 degrees, okay? So the question, on the post discussion for this, uh, for this uh, for forum, I will ask you to answer the question. The question is related to this slide for the plane, which was kind of convoluted word, basically. And the question, the 60 kilometer crosswind blows 80 kilometers per hour airplane at 110. Now, if the wind were going 80 kilometers per hour, the airplane would travel 113 kilometers per hour of an angle of, and the correct answer should be 45 degrees. So in your post tonight, your answer is going to be 45. You could put 45 degrees or 45. That's the correct answer, provided you have attended live or watched the video uh, with the, uh, in the, uh, later on, if you are not alive with, uh, sorry, if you're not live with us, <laughs> that's a very bad word, okay, alive. Sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so basically, 
that's because you're going to have a discussion. I'm going to post the, uh, this, uh, this uh, basically video later on, and we're going to have that discussion. Don't forget that you have assignments that are due, and please do ask questions if you have them. Any question? No? I told you it's going to be a short uh, lecture today. So you answer on the, uh, Jeffrey, yeah, it's a correct. There is a discussion form immediately following this on, on modules. There will be a discussion following this lecture. It's going to be chapter CH3 discussion, okay, for a grade. The only way to earn the grade is to answer this question. You cannot change your answer. You cannot go and change the answer and edit it. Because if you edit it, you lose points. So again, you put your answer either 45 or 45 degrees, whichever you like. The point being is you cannot see the answer of the other people unless you post yourself, okay? That's why I'm asking that you don't edit it because if you edit it, I will think probably that you did uh, change it. This is part of your participation grade and that's basically one of the things that I promise you will do from the beginning. Good, everybody else? Okay, if you guys don't have any question, I will see you uh, in two days from today. Thank you.